Okay, so I think we can go ahead and get started. I'm going to turn it over to uh, one of our committee members, Anya, to introduce our speaker, or our, our moderator, excuse me. Hi, welcome everyone. Happy last day of Women's History Month. We're going out with a bang. Really excited we could do this and really pleased to welcome Sarah Giorsi, who will moderate our, and guide our discussion today. Sarah is the executive director of NewMexicoWomen.org, which is an amazing fund, really one of a kind in New Mexico built to advance opportunities for women and girls as they build empowered lives. And NewMexicoWomen.org created this really thorough, excellent report called Gender Justice at the Heart of New Mexico's Pandemic Recovery, which really painted the picture for us of the need for a gender justice response as we recover from this pandemic. So thanks so much for being here to facilitate our exploration today, Sarah. Great, thank you, Anya, um, and welcome everybody. It's really an honor to be here. Um, thank you to the UNM Health Science Center Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for hosting this really important conversation. Um, I believe we're recording the event today. So if anyone doesn't agree with that or feels uncomfortable, please put it in the chat. Uh, but then it will be available online afterward, I, I imagine. Um, and later in the, in the presentation, we'll have an opportunity to ask questions of the panelists and you can also enter those into the chat and Anya will be um, sharing them with us. So as Anya said, I am the executive director of NewMexicoWomen.org, which is a statewide women's fund. And in addition to uh, research, which Anya mentioned, we also do grant making and we support gender justice work all over the state. And uh, we do training and education as well, convening organizations and strengthening the movement for gender and racial justice in New Mexico. And it's an honor to be here uh, with this powerful panel today. And before we start, I, I know that we might be calling in from all over the state or different locations, but I wanted to um, honor uh, UNM is hosting this conversation and it sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia. So I wanna acknowledge those original peoples of this land, both in Albuquerque and all over the state and recognize that those of us who are not native are guests and it is an honor to be a guest. I'm in Santa Fe and uh, it's the home of the Tewa people. Just wanna recognize that. And in addition to that, given the subject um, of today's discussion being COVID-19, I'd also like to take a moment of silence to honor all the lives that have been lost in the past year due to COVID and the pandemic. And um, simultaneously the lives lost due to, the, due to the other virus in our country of structural racism and systemic racism um, as we witness the, um, the case of George Floyd being tried as we speak. So if we can just take maybe 20 seconds to just sit in that and hold that, hold those lives and hold that, those memories. Just be in your heart. Thank you for that. It's also um, Transgender Visibility Day. So I wanna honor all of um, those who identify as transgender. And there has been an increase in violence against the transgender community in the past year. So we just honor that as well as we move forward in this conversation. And I just invite us all to stay in our hearts, even though we're in this funny environment online um, and it's heady, can, it can be heady. I just invite us to bring our whole beings here for the next uh, you know, 50 minutes, be together. Uh, we, some of us have never met, many of us, but it's an opportunity to connect as a community around a really important subject. And so with that, maybe we can take a deep breath. And um, as Anya said, it's the final day of Women's History Month. So we're looking today at how the pandemic has affected women in the workplace specifically, um, and how structural inequities have meant that women, and especially women of color, have been most impacted by this pandemic. 
And so from our report, I wanna read a quote um, from the Gender Justice at the Heart of Mexico's Pandemic Recovery, which is New Mexico Women.org's report. Um, and the quote is that the COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare in the most devastating of ways, existing structural inequities throughout our state. This means that self-identifying women, tribal communities, communities of color, the LGBTQIA community, and rural and immigrant communities throughout the state have been and are being disproportionately impacted by this crisis. And so our powerful lineup of panelists, I'd like to introduce right now, um, they've been on the front lines of the pandemic and some of them are parents themselves who are trying to navigate all of these challenges, both at the personal and the professional level. And so it's an honor to be here with you all. Um, and just so you know, their more extended bios are on the event page for this event. I won't be reading those, but please do check them out. These fierce, fierce accomplishments and all this, this powerful group. Um, so we start with Dr. Carolyn Montoya, who's the Associate Dean Office of Clinical Affairs at UNM and the Health Science Center Nurse College of Nursing. Welcome, Dr. Montoya. Uh, we have Joanna, Dr. Joanna Fair, who's the Vice Chair of Academic Affairs and the Senior Associate Dean for the Graduate Medical Education uh, and Associate Professor for the UNM School of Medicine and Radiology. Welcome, Dr. Fair. Uh, we have Dr. Alicia, Alicia Parada, who's an Associate Professor at the UNM SOM, Division Chief General Internal Medicine and Geriatrics and um, also the University of New Mexico Health Science Center Chair of the Diversity and Inclusion for the Department of Internal Medicine, Division of General Internal Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Parada. Uh, we have Jamie Silva Steele with us today, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the um, University of New Mexico Sandoval Regional Medical Center. Welcome, Jamie, there you are. And um, Eleanor Ch Chavez, who is the Executive Director of the National Union of Hospital and Healthcare Employees, um, District 1199 here in New Mexico. Welcome, Eleanor. And so we want to begin with um, a question around, we know that, you know, as it's been stated, that this crisis has amplified inequities that have existed long before the pandemic. And so Dr. Montoya, we'll start with you. Can you speak to the ways in which these pre-existing inequalities have been exposed and, and or exacerbated in your field? Well, thank you so much for your introduction and thank you for this opportunity. I think that in terms of how the pandemic has affected, um, certainly I am a nurse and a nurse practitioner. And as we know that uh, there has been a huge burden on nursing in general. And um, part of that, we have realized in New Mexico for a very long time that there is a nursing shortage. And um, this has only exacerbated that. Many of the nurses are extremely burned out at this point. And um, never having, knowing when you go in to be a nurse that you're going to see, you know, families that are devastated and you're going to see death, you're going to see this, but not in this mass, almost like a, a war where mm. you are seeing something um, that you just never expected. Mm. And the fact that we are talking about women, um, the pandemic, I also think, has just really focused on the fact that women are the caretakers. Mm. And we are talking about a lot of unpaid care that are provided by women for uh, almost everyone who has uh, dealt with uh, ill parents but also with children and then the fact that the schools are closed mm -hmm. and what are you doing now you have not now you've become mom and caretaker and now you've also become teacher and and how you do that um, you know when we talk about affecting women in general but also women of color especially the fact that the hospitality business has been so affected this is where you see a large number of women workers as well as uh, women of color working in these areas. And so they're losing jobs. There's a huge uh, number of women that have lost jobs. And so out of the workforce. And then finally, just I think it, 
you cannot go without saying there's also been a fair amount of domestic, an uptake in domestic violence uh, and crisis shelters in terms of dealing with that. So I'm going to mute because my dogs are barking, but that would be where I would start. Great, really, really important points, all of those. Um, and I'd like to invite Dr. Fair to respond to that question as well. Um, so I think it, the, the group that I work with most closely are uh, resident and fellow physicians. So we have 670 of them at UNM and about half are women. Um, you know, there are always uh, challenges with being uh, a female physician. And I would say that um, some of them have been exacerbated um, during this time of crisis. I would say um, certainly everything from the fact that resident physicians are in training. And so some of the options that are available to others in the workforce aren't available to them. So um, they, they have to come to the hospital and work every day and, and take care of patients. And some of the flexibility that other employees at UNM, myself included, um, have been able to have in terms of work from home, et cetera, you know, may not be there. And so then that workforce who then also may be parents and a decent number of our um, residents are parents are then just, you know, as with everyone else, trying to juggle childcare and home life and, and everything else and come to work um, and come to work in what is a very difficult environment. Um, residents mm -hmm. and fellows are very much on the front lines of patient care um, alongside our nursing staff who are just uh, absolutely incredible and have had really had so much to deal with during this pandemic. Um, many of them wound up uh, having their clinical experiences changed or um, you know, made more difficult or spent time working in the ICUs, et cetera, you know, that we, they perhaps hadn't anticipated. And so the, when the work burden becomes so great and then you know, juggling that against the home burden, it's been really you know, quite a challenge for a number of our um, residents and fellows. So I think um, taking something that you know, at, at baseline is challenging and then putting a pandemic on top of it you know, it has certainly exacerbated um, the, the challenges that our uh, residents and fellows, especially our, our women, uh, have faced. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And in our work, we talk about vicarious trauma, folks who are doing direct service in, in intense environments. And, and so I'm wondering if that, if any of you have seen that with um, the people you're working with and seeing Dr. Peretta shake your head, um, and how do you engage, you know, direct or hold and support people um, to do self-care while they're taking care of so many others? Uh, Dr. Parada, do you wanna answer that? Sure, thank you so much for having me on the panel today. Um, all of this really resonates um, with me as well. I have, um, over the past year, been doing the, uh, the medical director of the COVID follow-up clinic, which has um, provided ambulatory care for COVID patients who did not need hospitalization. And um, this has really been an important service because we know that there's a huge uh, disparity in primary care, especially in New Mexico. Yeah. And most of the majority of COVID patients actually recover outpatient. And so, you know, we've, we've provided care to a lot of um, different communities around New Mexico, including Native American population and a lot of people who don't have access to primary care. And, and yes, hearing the traumas, the, you know, all the deaths in the family, the fear of people um, is significant. And you know, from a physician clinician perspective, there's a lot of burnout with, mm. with the frontline clinicians as well, since there's, you know, there is a physician shortage, there is a clinician shortage in New Mexico. And you know, that balance of trying to get people to take leave or to try to provide their own self-care or where to reach out has been challenging, um, myself included, you know, this year has been very challenging for all of us. Um, and as a division chief, you know, trying to walk the talk during all of it definitely mm -hmm. has been challenging. Um, uh, and with my faculty, you know, luckily they've been so very supportive of me as well. And it's, it's really taken a lot of collaboration um, not just within my own division or the university, um, but there's a lot of people, um, you know, throughout the state, throughout the nation, who have been, you know, reaching out and really supportive. And luckily at UNM, we have our our wellness um, 
center that has, has done a lot during this pandemic to reach out to frontline workers, which has mm. been amazing. Mm. Um, and to try to try to help, um, you know, with childcare and things, but definitely you can see how it hits women and definitely um, women of color, underrepresented minorities, mm. very, very hard. Mm, mm, mm. Um, thank you. Yeah, I just want to also like honor you all for being in leadership roles during this time as well, because then it, it kind of adds, it compounds this, the pressure and the, the potential burnout. Um, I'll move on to the next, the next question. And, and for you, Eleanor, um, in our work, uh, we see that um, women of color have been on the front lines of many efforts to address the needs in their communities, um, whether that's a mutual aid effort or a community organizing effort, or even pushing policy that supports families and children at this time. Um, so where have you seen women's leadership really um, being highlighted during this pandemic? And where has it also gone unsung and unnoticed? Thank you. Um, so basically what I wanted to do you know, in terms of this question was really look at um, you know, there's been a lots of mutual aid, you know, in Albuquerque, I'm, that's the one that I'm more uh, familiar with. And, you know, women really have led the charge for that, right? They've led the charge in terms of reaching out to people who, you know, didn't have basic necessities like food, um, basic necessities like being able to care for their children when, when, um, when the schools were closed. And then also caring for each other, um, you know, when a family member or, um, you know, one of their friends was sick, um, trying to figure out how to do that and, and not also, you know, becoming ill themselves. But I think one of the other things that, that I saw um, during the, begin the very beginning of the pandemic was in the leadership of our very own union, um, which is mostly women. Um, and basically what they did was, we represent five hospitals in New Mexico. And so basically what happened there was, um, you know, putting together some um, recommendations um, that we felt were important in terms of protecting those frontline workers. And what we did and what they did was not just, um, you know, look at our ends as frontline workers, but really the broad scope of who a frontline worker is. Because a lot of the uh, workers, and I think these are really the invisible workers in the hospital, are those workers who do some of the other work, right? And who were very exposed as well. And so basically our concern was the need to protect them and to protect their families. For example, you know, you have housekeepers um, who I think people don't really think about as frontline workers, but inside healthcare, they, they really are, right? Mm -hmm. Without them, we wouldn't have the kinds of, um, you know, um, we wouldn't have a clean hospital. We wouldn't have a, a clean uh, a room for a patient to go into. And, and I, saw, um, I saw a lot of women um, workers, healthcare workers inside the hospital really stand up to take care of their patients. Some of the stories that I heard, um, especially were from uh, not just the RNs, but also I'm thinking about interpreters. Um, and we don't think about interpreters as frontline workers, right? But, um, you know, there was one interpreter, a Navajo interpreter, who went out of her way to make sure that the families who did not speak or the patients who did not speak English understood what was going on to them. Mm -hmm. And she was really the bridge, right, mm -hmm. between that patient and their families because the families couldn't enter the rooms, right? We, we've all heard about that difficulty. Mm -hmm. um, and so for her, um, you know, she was the caretaker of her people. And that's how she was able to do that. Um, I, I, there, was, there are so many women uh, who come to mind who, who were able to um, just really, I don't know what I, how I want to just, just barely, basically stand up without, not, not necessarily without regard to themselves because they definitely knew and understood that they needed to take care of their own um, um, health and they needed to use the precautions. But they did that. Um, and then also, um, you know, took care of the patients. A lot of, there were some, some of the women, some of the providers who actually lived in, um, in a trailer in front of their home so that they, when they came home, they wouldn't contaminate their families. Um, so, so those kinds of things. Um, women did, did um, you know, there were a lot of sacrifices that a lot of women did. And I think, you know, it, in terms of being women, we do what we always do, right? We take care of everybody yeah. else, and yeah. um, you know sometimes we think of ourselves last, yeah. um, but always out there thinking about everybody else. Yeah, 
Yeah, thank you for bringing that up about the interpreters. There's so many roles I can imagine that are invisible that haven't been making headlines. You know, we see talk about nurses and teachers and and grocery store workers, but then there's all these other um, people in the in the, in that space that have been so brave and courageous and stepped up. And so, thank you for making that visible. It's really important. And I want to um, invite you, Jamie, to to speak to that question as well about women's leadership and where you see it's been. Um, sort of highlighted and featured and where maybe it, it, it's gone unnoticed. Thank you. And again, thanks for uh, having us uh, today. I, um, again, echo a lot of what's already been uh, said. Uh, in my organization, we're a 60 bed community academic hospital in Rio Rancho. And 72% uh, of our uh, workforce is female. 64% uh, of our workforce is uh, uh, minority. And uh, the bulk of our staff come from Sandoval County, the county in which we reside. So our county just from by its nature has, uh, I believe now seven uh, tribal communities also borders on uh, Navajo Nation and um, is 30 almost 3800 square miles as far as county um, population uh, and uh, distance. So it's, it's a very large community. And I think that, you know, what everybody's already uh, discussed are the, the ways that women uh, throughout this uh, last year have really risen above the challenge. They've already been rising to the challenge, but above the challenge uh, to continue to deliver care within the facility and then within their uh, immediate home settings. Uh, we had the opportunity as we started to strategize about schools being closed, you know, to, to, because we're a smaller facility, we can, we're more nimble in being able to strategize around strategies for the workforce. And uh, many of our uh, staff, women primarily, you know, strategized about how to job share their work, how mm -hmm. to take care of each other's kids so that, um, you know, one could work and uh, just did so in a way that really was remarkable. Uh, that's one example. Uh, the other piece is that our entire uh, emergency operations center, which finally stood down on March 10th, but was up for, uh, you know, 372 days, was primarily led by women. Uh, we, you know, in either the incident commander role or in the uh, various chief roles of the emergency operations center. And um, that's also a phenomenal experience in, in an emergency operations center. Typically, you uh, come together for a quick flood or a quick hurricane or a quick disaster, and you're over with in several hours or maybe a you know week. And as you all know, this has you know lasted over 372 days or mm -hmm. longer. And so, just the fact that we had to function in that mindset, which is different than running your normal operations. Uh, it's the structure in which you make very quick decisions around all the various policy changes that were occurring uh, required uh, us to think through that emergency operations structure in a way that allowed people breaks from that role. So we had to have like 3D uh, at least. Uh, you couldn't be the incident commander for the entire year. So we had to train people up. People took on new roles and responsibilities. And again, you know, I just commend not just my organization, but all organizations that had to do that work because mm -hmm. it has been very enduring to, to go through that. Uh, plus make sure that your staff and your providers are safe. I mean, that was probably the most critical thing for us as leaders was communicating as fast as we could without creating confusion Mm. and making it clear enough that people felt safe to be at work uh, because it was, as you all know, a time where everything was very uncertain and policy was changing hourly at some times. So uh, communication was very important. And again, uh, through, through leadership, through, through the you know, various management team and, and various uh, functions of the Emergency Operations Center, uh, com coming through with very concise, rapid communication, being present, rounding uh, in units where the care was being given to give people space to uh, talk, cry, uh, you know, uh, decompress was very, very uh, important. So again, because of 
our workforce, knowing that you know a lot of our leaders um, are women, that was um, a time that really they have really done amazing work. Mm, mm, powerful examples. Um, really, especially, I mean, but all of that was powerful. Just thinking about the ways in which women come together to um, create a village, to take care of each other's kids in these moments, right? And how do we job share? And how do we get creative in these moments of crisis? And it, it sounds like that those are such beautiful examples of that. Um, and I'm just wondering if any of the other panelists want to speak to that question before I move on to the next one about women's leadership. No. Um, I recently heard a podcast where they were talking about how in this past year on a collective level, we've all been sort of in fight or flight in this hypervigilant state. And I can imagine in your work, especially when you're running an emergency operations center, it's high vigilance all the time and like having to rotate people out and make sure people are caring for their own nervous systems. Um, and so again, it kind of goes back to a question I asked earlier, but how do we support women um, in these roles right now? Um, what kind of support do they need uh, to sustain this level of engagement with their work, but also while they're trying to maintain um, their own community needs as well and family needs as well and child care needs. Um, so I'm gonna ask um, you, Dr. Parada, to start us out with that. What kind sure. of- Sure, during, you know, during this time, you know, life still happens. Yeah. Um, I know it's, it's hard to remember that. And, you know, I had faculty, a faculty member who became pregnant during the pandemic and had a baby. Um, you know, we've had we've had a lot of different medical emergencies. We've, we've unfortunately had family deaths um, that have affected not only myself but other people in my position. And you know, I think part of it, everybody wanted to help, right? We're we're that's what we're in medicine for. We want to be there for people and help. And so everybody was quick to respond and um, want to play whatever role they could. Um, in this response, no matter what it was. Um, it, and there's been a lot of conversations about this and making sure that we're being reflective of our needs and also um, being honest with that. And I think, you know, as a, as a leader, um, you know, giving permission to people that it's okay. Mm. You need to take some time. This is very important. Um, something that our, um, our department chair, um, Dr. Mark Unruh has done, has, you know, you've gone through everybody's leave, they put spreadsheets up and said, hey, you know, there's a lot of people who have zero leave this year. Mm -hmm. We really need to, we need to do something about this. And so normalizing it. So I'm gonna take leave next week and I'm telling everybody, hey, I'm gonna be on leave. Everybody, we need to do this for each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and when someone's sick, you know, I, I, I always say, you know, one of the silver linings of the pandemic is we've been able to perform video visits and be at work remotely. So we're not necessarily going in and putting ourselves at risk. At the same time, it has also made us too available mm -hmm. at work, you know, you know and for me too. And um, for me to tell people when you're sick, it's not okay. You need to, you need to rest. Mm -hmm. I know you could jump on that meeting by phone or Zoom or you could, you know, see some patients or call some patients over the telephone. But you need to really take that time and rest and, you know, really being a little more directive, which I don't usually love to do. Um, and I think at this point in time to try to help curb that burnout and, and just normalize that it's okay that we're feeling this way. And again, like walking that talk and Absolutely, really good points. Yeah, we have this obsession with overproductivity sometimes, and especially now that we can be on any time. You're right. We have to really encourage and normalize self care. Um, how about you, Dr. Fair? Do you want to respond to that in terms of what kinds of support women need? Uh, you know, I would say that probably the biggest thing for our residents and fellows is, you know, have has been having the opportunity to be heard. So we have a resident and fellow council. Um, three of the leaders of that council, of the, of the four chairs, three are women. Um, they bring forward their you know, unique challenges and circumstances, both in general and being uh, in residency, but also in, uh, in the time of the pandemic. 
Uh, we tried to be really responsive to what they brought forward. And some of these are very basic needs. People are afraid of bringing COVID home to their families. So how mm -hmm. do we protect them? Mm -hmm. And one you know, has been the health system has certainly stepped up in terms of whether it's providing alternative sites, figuring out places for people to shower, all of that kind of thing. But that's very basic. Like I'm afraid that I'm gonna give this to my family when I come home. Um, I, the other really critical thing has been when there was a vaccine available, making sure that our healthcare workers from attending physicians through nursing staff, through environmental services to residents, fellows, and our medical students and beyond were all prioritized to be vaccinated so mm -hmm. that again, they could feel safe taking care of these patients. And I think um, the health system really did an extraordinary job of, of doing that. If we can't keep our people safe, then everything else is, is really mm -hmm. tough, right? So mm -hmm. safety, focusing on PPE, making sure mm -hmm. people were protected and that they could feel safe with their families has been really critical. And I, and I just have to say that throughout the UNM health system, there are just incredible women leaders. I mean, you've got a few of them on the on the call right now. So Dr. Parada, you know, Ms. Silva Steele, but whether you look at our occupational health system, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Olivia Hopkins, who has been, you know, really key in making sure that we had policies and procedures to keep people safe, Dr. Megan Brett in infectious disease and epidemiology, um, Kate Becker, Irene Agostini, the CMO. Martha McGrew, our senior associate dean. I mean, I could just keep going. Mm -hmm. um, these incredible women leaders who are really focused on people. Um, and so I have to say that as difficult as this time has been, it's also been um, something to see how much we have really tried to keep our people safe and to see the leadership that has gone on um, throughout the institution. Mm -hmm. This is really powerful to hear. And thank you for naming all those women. Um, and there just, are more. That was just yes, the ones sure. that popped in my head. <laughs> um, started switching, to, similar question, but switching it a little bit um, for you, Dr. Montoya, um, in terms of policies, um, what kind of policies do you think need to be put in place in order to support uh, women uh, in the workplace right now and, uh, and their families? So I was just looking at the chat and there is a, a great comment that, that speaks to this. It's, it's saying, do you foresee that some changes to our work environment will stay when we go back to the normal? And I think that this is a, a really um, seminal question because you know we have uh, in the College of Nursing, we have this, because we're teaching, we, have this ability to either go into the office or be at home or everything is on Zoom. And so I think that there really is going to have to be, um, it's going to have to be looked at pretty closely. Just how much do you have to be in the office and how can you have a flex schedule and that it isn't going to be that you totally work from home perhaps. But I think UNM, it's such a big system and making a change like that is not easy. Um, at all, because the expectation is it's a state institution and, you know, you should be there uh, if you are doing the teaching mission of UNM from this eight to five. And in fact, a lot of the staff that I work with, that we do clinical placements for all of our nursing students. We have a thousand students. We have a thousand, we are the largest college on the health sciences center with a thousand students. Of those thousand, we have 500 that are undergraduate students. They need all of these placements and I have to give kudos to UNMH because even in the pandemic, when, when we had to shut clinicals down entirely, we did that for safety reasons. But we also started on a plan of how to get the students back into clinical rotations and UNMH could not have been a better partner with that. So the question of what, what things are gonna to have to change, how are we going to do this? Are we going to be doing more simulation with our students um, so that we can get more students in? There is an initiative all the way down from President Stokes through um, our VP at the Health Sciences Center that we are in a severe nursing shortage. It's uh, even more predominant uh, than we, than we um, 
than when we started out. And we are gonna have to up it in terms of producing more nursing staff. We were able to graduate a cohort, imagine last May, when we had to stop clinicals, we had to go to simulation, we converted to uh, Zoom classes and we graduated about a hundred nurses, nurses mm -hmm. uh, in May. And we're scheduled to do the same thing right now. Mm -hmm. So those are, are things that, um, you know, show the adaptability of women because we're primarily a female profession in nursing. Mm -hmm. And um, again, you make it work. But I, I really do think that question about what is going to be these job sharing op options, mm -hmm. the flexible, are we going to see more in terms of flexible hours? And all of that's going to be a big HR headache. Mm -hmm. because, you know, UNM is a big place. Yeah. And they, because it's a state institution, we are very careful that we are adhering to all of these policies. And I think there's going to be a I think there's going to be a push from women saying, look, I did it for a year. Yeah. I did it for a year and a half. And now you're telling me that I can't, I can't do this. I've just shown you that I can. Right. Right. And look at how it benefited my children and my family and my, and my parents who are elderly. And look, it, there is another way. And we just, exactly. We just had a year of it. So why go back to these other sort of more strict um, might I say, dare I say, patriarchal ways of, of working when we can change the work culture and now's the opportunity. Um, Eleanor Chavez, I'd love to invite you to respond to that question about policies or things that are changing. What, what do you see? You read my mind. <laughs> yeah, uh, so basically I think that we, we, you know, we're hoping that, that you know, some um, can still work from home because I think it has been beneficial to them and their kids. Um, but I also think that we need to remember that there are jobs that cannot and haven't been able to do that, right? Right. right. Been able to do any kind of job sharing. And the majority of those, um, you know, if we're talking about hospitals, you know, I'll, I'll raise the issue of the housekeepers or even the kitchen workers. You know, the majority of them are women and they were never able to work from home. Um, they were never, never able to really stop working because they, 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 were, they were considered vital. Right. Mm -hmm, and I think we also need to think about other workers in our community um, who don't have access to sick leave. I think that the pandemic really hit them hard. Um, you all probably know about the legislation that passed this past legislative session. I don't know if it's been signed by the governor yet, but um, that afforded sick leave and it won't start till next year to, for example, um, restaurant workers. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we need to be thinking about all, and they're the majority of them, you know, waitresses and, you know, they're, the majority of, of the service industry is women. So really need to think about, um, you know, the whole pandemic and, and the impact of it on women sort of at a community level. And I think there's different layers to it, right? Mm -hmm. So there's the layer of, you know, the office worker who can work at home. And then there's a layer of those workers who, who never will be able to do that. So really keeping them in mind and figuring out, you know, how can we be flexible with them as well? Mm -hmm. um, I think the whole question of, um, you know, the impact of um, just the whole discussion about sick leave was a big issue for a whole lot of people. I think somebody mentioned it earlier that, um, you know, people didn't have access or they ran out of their sick leave. Um, and for us, for some of the people that we represent, they actually ran out during the pandemic, they ran out of not only their sick leave, but also their vacation time. So mm -hmm. now they have no time to care for themselves. They have no self-care time. Um, and especially if you're, um, if you're a caretaker, if you're, if you're a mom with kids, um, you're gonna be out for yourself, you're gonna be out for your kids. If you have a spouse or a partner, you're gonna be out for them as well. So all of those are just really double impacts uh, for, for women. And I think that you know, policymakers need to be thinking about that um, as, they, as we move forward into you know, post-pandemic, because obviously this isn't gonna be the last pandemic. I hope that it will, but Mm. And I mean, that sort of the predictions are that it's not right. So really looking forward, how can we learn from this and how can we make things easier on workers and especially women workers and especially those women workers who don't have sort of the privilege of having, um, you know, certain kinds of works that allows them more flexibility. Mm -hmm. Excellent. 
Um, how about you, um, Jamie Civil Steel, um, in terms of that question? Thank yeah. you so much, Dylan. That was really powerful. Yes, I, I uh, agree with a lot of what has uh, been said already. I think there's a couple things that I think about at a local level around policy and then at a more maybe state level around policy. I think there's different levels. Obviously, within organizations, uh, this was also you know, a time where we were uh, trying to problem solve very fast. And some of the policy that we developed that I think could be replicated and is in many situations in many organizations, but uh, we did not have at the time uh, like a catastrophic leave uh, bank or a situation mm -hmm. for, to apply for catastrophic leave. Uh, we came developed criteria that uh, if an individual staff member could not pay their bills, like basic things like rent, car payment, utilities, mm -hmm. uh, they submitted to Human Resources a request, and uh, we covered those out of our uh, crisis fund that we established the UNAM Foundation. Um, one would think that. Um, if you opened a fund like that, that you would have a line out your hospital with people wanting all their bills paid. That was definitely not the case at all. I mean, we really saw some uh, very, you know, minimal examples, but very real examples of people that couldn't get to work because they they didn't have good tires on their car, uh, or they had months of utility bills that they could not take care of because they had lost a secondary job that you know, was in the food industry as an example. So I think that there should be situations where people don't have to stress about those basic needs because if they're stressing about the basic needs, they can't function in their work environment at 100%. So that's one thing that, that, we've, been, that we've been fortunate of being able to implement and I think is a good idea for other facilities to consider. The other thing kind of coming out of this that I think, uh, I don't know if it's policy as much as it would be a nice to have is a requirement that there's mental health first aid training for every individual in the community. Um, that's within our local you know, settings as well as just like learning CPR you know, as a basic requirement. We're, we're gonna have a pandemic of the, you know, now of behavioral health matters uh, and we're already obviously seeing that uh, within the last few weeks. Uh, I feel that that is something that needs to be uh, considered at a, at a state level, that these are basic kinds of things that tools that will help people to figure out how to de-escalate situations, how to obtain support, um, how to make sure that someone's safe, um, you know, if they're suicidal. So there are some of those basic things and I know our behavioral health system is already taxed but um, there's a lot that we could do as you know, lay community people to uh, help the situation. So that, that is one thing. And then my last thing, and I know I'm probably using up all the airspace here, but at a highest level, um, if we maintain telehealth visits, telecommuting, we have to have the appropriate infrastructure statewide um, to do that successfully. And I know our legislative people know this already. It's not like they don't. But we have to, just as rapidly as we pulled up telehealth, we have to as rapidly pull up the infrastructure to make sure that we're successful. Because I do think we will have people working indefinitely at home, uh, patients indefinitely calling us, videoing in. And the disparity of because you live out in XYZ, you have to drive is going to be something that we're going to have to uh, think through. And again, for my county here, uh, you know, several hours in the car to get to us will not be helpful when somebody can, you know, easily dial in that lives in Rio Rancho to get an, their appointment. So that is something that is in living color that we're going to need to address sooner than later. And it's definitely an issue in rural areas in New Mexico in terms of access and equitable access. And so you bring up such a good point where so many of our rural communities don't have access to broadband. And so how do they, you know, it becomes an inequity issue about who has access and who doesn't. Um, thank you for bringing that point up and for all your points. Uh, I invite the audience to um, share any questions you might have in the chat. Um, and we'll look at an, another question um, in the meantime. Um, one of our other reports that NewMexicoWomen.org produced um, in 2016 is called The Heart of Gender Justice. And it 
looked at health equity, health equity and economic security um, issues around the state, and we did community and the community engagement process where we did listening um, circles all around the state. And what we heard from communities, one of their recommendations uh, with that report was uh, the need to educate elected officials, people in positions of power, thought leaders, policymakers around these issues of gender and race and the history of colonization in New Mexico. Um, and we know that there are deep you know, racial and gender inequities in all fields, including in medicine. Um, so I'll start with you, um, Dr. Parada, about um, what's your perspective on this in terms of healthcare workers, uh, in terms of educating people in charge of educating healthcare workers um, and people who are serving on the front lines uh, around these issues of race and gender inequities? Yes, this is a great question. Um, and I know this is this has all been magnified. A lot of these issues have been magnified during this time, um, which has been really significant. Um, and I know that the HSC Office of Diversity has done a lot of work, especially with um, white coats for Black and Indigenous lives. There's been a lot of initiatives with, with all the things that are coming up around the world. Um, with this topic and not just here in New Mexico. And here in New Mexico, I mean, we still have a lot of work to do, um, even though there are a lot of women and, um, you know, at, at UNM, there are a lot of women who are um, from underrepresented minority backgrounds who are leaders. Um, and so I think that's the first step where we do have this representation and, and there's people here on this call and I think that that's incredible. Um, and we have to speak up. We have to continue to be advocates, not only for ourselves and the other um, healthcare workers, we need to be advocates for our community and continue to bring up the disparities, um, the major disparities that we have here in our state. Nice. Can you share more about White Coats for Black and Indigenous Lives? Is that a, an initiative? I see um, Dr. Sanchez is on the call. Maybe he can give yeah, yeah. more information on that. I know some of my faculty are highly involved, but I'm not directly involved in this. Great. Yeah, um, thank you, Dr. Parada. Um, so first of all, let me say thank you so much to, for everyone for joining this uh, session. I'm extremely important, and we wanna make sure that um, we uh, maintain and re-engage women in, in uh, having their careers um, as, as we get through this epidemic, pandemic, move forward. Um, I, I think as mentioned by Dr. Parada and many groups or many individuals, um, we, we have known about gender inequity and race and ethnic inequity for decades, pre-1964 and after 1964. We still struggle uh, to achieve ethnic, racial, and gender uh, equity issues. And I think what um, uh, COVID represented was another stark reminder of how significant it is for women um, and other communities. Uh, there are a number of groups on campus at the Health Sciences Center that have dedicated themselves to um, investigating and addressing the inequities that exist. White Coats for Black and Indigenous um, Lives is one central group at Health Sciences Center. Um, as we know, there's been other groups. The American Medical Women's Association just had their national conference this past week and have um, for over a hundred years have been active in addressing inequity in the health workforce. Uh, and there's a number of groups I could go on and on and on. But I think all of these groups are dedicated not only looking at inequity um, through the lens of COVID, but also in terms of matriculation to our graduate programs and building community initiatives. So I'll definitely put a link uh, in the chat box because I think all of you represent incredible role models for the learners involved in these groups. And I know they would be very grateful if they can reach out to you for further guidance. So I hope that helps. Thank you so much, Dr. Sanchez, it's nice to meet you. Um, I'm gonna just open it to the panelists to address that question if anyone wants to jump in. 
um, around how do we educate around these issues. I am. Um... I, I'm very passionate about this topic because um, one, it's almost been my life's work um, around educating myself and then making sure that I can bring uh, competencies into the workplace. Uh, there, I think this is again, a fundamental uh, kind of like CPR. Yeah. It should be basic stuff. It shouldn't be uh, masters prepared uh, a theory that to get people to understand, I think, as Dr. Sanchez just pointed out, you know, we're in the 21st century and we're still dealing with things that just mm -hmm. make no sense. Um, I, what I'm very proud of is Dr. Uh, Zidonis, our new executive vice president. This is at the very, very top of his priority list and his values. Uh, those that have heard him hopefully have seen that as he has been here now 120 days, uh, he's already assigned diversity, equity, inclusion goals to all of his executive team, um, to the, uh, you know, all the leaders of the Health Science Center. And that's just that by itself is this very, very huge statement. Uh, we can all say we're, we want to address inequities, but unless it's written down as a priority, it ends up being deprioritized, right? So I think that we as leaders, as, as people, we just have to, you know, kind of stand up for the fact that we are in the 21st century. This is, there's a way that we should be thinking about inequities and, and uh, racial injustice. And uh, this, you know, it is time's up kind of. Uh, mm -hmm. And for our own staff here, uh, again, in the health system, there is requirements to, you know, continue to have these competencies as part of our ongoing learning. And there's a lot that we still need to cover. You know, they're, they're, we're basically skimming the surface, but I think this needs to be an ongoing dialogue and through the Office of Diversity. I just feel that we have this such a rich source um, to continue to tap into. So uh, I'm proud of the work that we have done thus far, but a lot more can be done. Mm. Yeah, and we've seen, um, you know, departments of diversity and equity just explode in all sectors um, since last summer in particular, like, and it's so important to, to be doing this kind of education. And then how do we operationalize it? What does it look like? How do we have uh, leaders of color in the pipeline um, and making sure women of color's voices are centered? And so it's like, it, there's, there's a lot of work to do. There's the education piece and then there's the actual applying it. Um, and making sure that we are rearranging power structures, right? And that we are centering voices that have been marginalized. Um, so I'm just looking at the time, we have five more minutes and wanna invite other panelists to address that question. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that that's a, a, I mean, that's a huge question, right? And, and, and racism has been around for a long time and, and the university and UNMH and other kinds of institutions, city governments, state governments, um, all have to deal with the with the fact that institutional racism exists within their structures, um, and how do we break down those barriers? That's that's really very difficult. But I think um, it needs to really um, the education needs to filter down uh, into all levels and all sectors of of um, of the institutions. And I think that you know admitting that um, is probably the first step, right? Um, I've had conversations with you know, folks at, you know, the hospital, because that's where the most, the majority of my work um, gets done. And, and for, for some of them who are in leadership positions, they don't really necessarily understand what that means. Mm -hmm. um, so I agree, we have a lot of education that, that still needs to take place. I think the other thing that, that, um, that we need to do is really look at um, creating ways for um, everyone, um, and I'm talking about the workers to be able to move um, to move forward in terms of their own education as well. I mean, that's another way that that you bring diversity to the workplace, right? Lifting people up, lifting women up, and and making it easier for them to get their own education so that they're also moving forward. Um, I think that's another way to create some diversity and to create um, to lift up voices. Um, Great, thank you so much. Um, so I just want to make sure we um, addressed your question. I think we did earlier, Catherine, um, but in terms of, do you feel like we've addressed that question? I don't see any others at the moment. 
And um, maybe in the last three minutes, panelists, if you have any other final um, comments or summary comments you want to make. The only other thing that I wanted to, to raise was really looking at, and I think it was raised a little bit, but you know, farther down the road, um, the impact of the uh, trauma that maybe some of the healthcare givers have experienced and have not yet been able to come to terms with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know if it's going to manifest itself in, in some form of PTSD, but mm -hmm. I do know that in talking to a lot of the caretakers, um, and I had mentioned a couple of the interpreters, I mean, they're, they are suffering from some real trauma. Um, and I think, um, you know, in terms of looking at the behavioral health system, is it going to be equipped to deal with that? Um, and, and we need to basically recognize that, that that's something that may, that we may be seeing down the line, not right now, maybe not for some people, but down the line is something that, that, uh, we need to deal with as well. Mm. Yeah. I mean, if there's an emergency crisis fund, is there also a self-care and healing fund for, um, for, for workers who have or are experiencing PTSD and, and trauma, and how do we invest in that wellness? You know, how, and at what levels do we invest in that in that wellness in our own wellness? Um, any other final comments before I hand it over to Melissa for our Shiro's presentation that um, we're adding on to this meeting? Well, thank you all. Uh, I'm gonna transition over to Melissa. You're all so wonderful and powerful. Thank you for your bravery, your heart, your love, your commitment to your communities um, and for stepping up in service in this way. Um, and it's just been an honor to speak with you all this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and for moderating as well. Um, I think you were absolutely incredible and uh, just such a warm and welcoming presence. And thank you for embodying that. Thank you so, so much. I would like to agree and thank you, Sarah, as well as all of our panelists for this amazing conversation. This has just been such a fantastic final panel for our Women's History Month celebration here at HSC. Uh, obviously these issues have touched all of us on so many different levels and in so many different ways. And, and this wonderful and thoughtful conversation here today, I think really elevated some of the questions that we still need to continue to be asking ourselves as we move forward. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for your time and for being here today.